Uh, again, everybody, thanks for uh, joining this, uh, this webinar. I'm really looking forward to uh, the opportunity uh, to chat with these gentlemen over the next uh, little while here. Um, as, as we said, from an AISC standpoint, uh, we have the opportunity uh, to put together uh, this avenue uh, during our downtime, which is obviously a, a different avenue than our than our everyday lives. But you know, it gives us a, a a good opportunity to tune in and to you know get reference towards some of the pathways that many of us have, have are, are seeking, or, or or many players are in, are in the middle of of, of that path. Um, in our last uh, webinar, we had the opportunity to catch up with, with our coaches and get a little bit of, a, of an expanded profile and towards their journey in the game and uh, their, their, their experiences. Uh, one of the major experiences in Coach Ainsley's life, not only from, from the sporting side, from the soccer side, but also from, from the life side, um, which gave him experiences to, uh, to grow up and to, and to look at life uh, from, from a different avenue was, was his time in Germany. And uh, in, in that webinar, as, as, as you guys have heard, uh, you know, he'd referenced many, many players that were of great influence to him. And uh, one of the players that we have here uh, that, that he did mention, uh, we have the honor of having uh, as a guest here today, um, Steve Chirundolo, uh, who is a World Cup veteran, uh, a professional player in, 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 in Germany for uh, 15 seasons. Uh, in, in the Bundesliga, uh, for the most part, top flight, a captain of, of a Bundesliga team. Uh, for us in Ontario soccer, uh, let, let AIFC alone, it's, it's an honor uh, to have him here and uh, with us, joining us. It's, it's definitely uh, not relevant voices that we hear every day uh, within our avenues. And Coach Ainsby, I'll, I'll, I'll let you just touch in on, on sort of you know, your, your background, your introduction, I see you smiling already, so I'm happy to hear, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in yeah. hearing that. Steve, uh, you know, to, to first thing and foremost, to have Steve on here is, is a huge honor for me, personally and, and professionally. Um, Steve uh, played with uh, Julian Guzman for, for a number of years in Hanover, and that's where I met him. Um, and since that time, um, we have maintained our friendship. Um, I consider him a brother to me um, from afar. He he really took me under his wing when I was in Hanover playing. Um, and the, the 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 I mean, there's many fond memories, but the the memory that sticks out in my mind when I when I think of Steve is, you know, he always would tell me that Ains' um, advice is always free, and he was he really um, he really took me under his wing and. We had many conversations about, about football, about life, about the German culture, about um, my experiences in, in, in trying to acclimatize myself to the German culture. Um, but it's always been nothing but love uh, for Steve and his family. I had the, the honor of going to his wedding a few years ago and reconnecting with, with some of uh, some old friends in, in Germany. But uh, Steve has, you know, he's, He's a classy guy. He's, they call him the mayor of Hanover. Uh, I, I don't know why, but they do. Um, but, you know, uh, someone that, that is very, very intelligent in the game as well. He knows the game from a, from a very unique perspective. Uh, like you said, Manny, he spent, uh, well, he's a World Cup veteran. He's played in the World Cup, I believe, three times. Uh, he captained Hanover. I think he captained the national team a little bit as well. So, um, but yeah, it's an, it's an honor to have Steve uh, here with us. You know, he's uh, six or seven hours ahead of us, so we won't, we won't try to talk him up too much. But I um, just want to ask him some questions, Steve, um, to you. And these questions were, were from, from the boys. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with, with the first question. Um, what was the most mentally difficult challenge you faced throughout your career? And also, maybe you want to uh, give into context how long you played. I know Manny said 15. I think we have it as 15 years, but I'm pretty sure it's a little bit longer than that. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about the, the mental toughness that you faced uh, as a professional. Well, before I jump into that question, um, um, thank you for the kind words from all of you, especially you, Ainsley. Um, you know, when Ainsley uh, reached out to me, I didn't, didn't uh, hesitate for a minute. Of course, anytime I can speak to a friend, even though it is just a video conference, but this will have to do for now, Ains. But um, anytime I get to see his face is great and, uh, and to speak to him as well. So I appreciate the time you guys are giving me. Um, 
and to answer your question, for me, the most difficult time, uh, or one of the things that really set in with me was the moment the game that I loved playing and I still do, um, had so much fun enjoying, um, became a profession, became a job. Um, I really do remember that. I was about 21, maybe 20. Yeah, I think it was 21. Um, so two years into my freshman career, um, I realized, okay, this is, there's more to it than just going out there and having a ball every day and, and, and trying my hardest. There's, I have to maintain my position, my standard of play. Um, I have to treat my body like a professional. I have to go about, um, you know, what I say to the coaches, what I say to the journalists, um, to fans, um, present myself in a professional manner. Um, that's something that, that I found kind of difficult, that transition for one. Um, and I think the other thing that goes along with that is, and I mentioned the media, getting used to the, the negativity of the media. Um, and, you know, as a player, you're usually pretty egoistic, egoistic about reading articles and especially your own performances. And the negativity that I was approached with here in Germany was um, something I had to deal with, and it took me a long time to get used to that, to understand where the journalists were coming from. Um, so I would think that is probably the biggest issue I had to deal with playing a, as a professional here in Germany for, you guys got it right, for 15 years. Yeah, the, uh, the German culture is definitely something that uh, would be a little bit more serious, I think, than, than we're used to here in, in, in North America, especially when it comes to you know, the, the, the attitude of work. You know, it's 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 really uh, considered, a, from what I find, a, a much more serious and intent and and uh, less less social than we would be used to here in sports in North America. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you when you look at sports in in North America, most of the um, journalists and most of the newspapers and, and TV channels are trying to make heroes out of sports stars, whereas in Germany they're very critical, um, and they're really trying to knock you down. So they build the other side and knock you down to sell their paper. So it's just a completely different way of going about their job. Um, and I find it I found it very difficult because I like to think myself and I try to present myself in a very positive manner and always see the glass is half full as opposed to half empty. And so I, I had I had some some issues getting used to that mentality. Nice. Um, at what age were you identified to be on the pathway in becoming a pro? Um, my uh, youth club in San Diego, California was the San Diego Nomads. And at that club, I had the privilege of, of um, being coached by coaches who had played in, in Europe, in England. Um, um, his name was Derek Armstrong and his son was David Armstrong. Both of them had played professionally in England. And they had always given us some videos of, of play in England back in the day. Um, this must have been, those videos were probably late 80s, early 90s. And that was my first influence to European football. Um, a lot of, I'll say the ages of Ian Rush and uh, the Liverpool days. Um, some, of my, some of my heroes growing up. And for those who are listening, that was VHS videos, not, uh, not DVDs or just straight off of a, um, uh, you know, a digital file. So um, I watched these goals. I think they were like, Premier League, so the Premiership's best 100 goals of season 91 all the way up until 99 um, before I went. And so that would really influence me growing up to really put the seat in my head, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to become a pro. Um, and then all along the way, you get some feedback from coaches in, in, in the United States and Southern California. The Olympic Development Program was, um, you know, the path that one went on. I was a late bloomer, so there were other players who – who made it into the development program earlier than I did. Like, uh, for example, maybe it's a, a, a name that everybody might know was Carlos Bocanegra, who was a captain of the United States national team as well. Um, he and I grew up together in the soccer world and you know, he was identified earlier because I was more of a late bloomer. So to give a short answer to your question, I think I was noticed, I popped onto the radar of most coaches in the United States just before recruiting for college was going on so I was, I was just about 18 17 18 and then um you know i started to turn a few heads <laughs> that's that's interesting um and i could see when you mentioned uh the liverpool days i can see coach manny his eyes were twinkling because he's a big liverpool fan so um kudos kudos to you um and then you may mention that that you your 
kind of blossom, so to speak, at the age of 17, 18. And that's, that's quite unique because the boys that we work with are, are roughly around that age from 15, 16, 17, 18. So it's nice to hear that, that, you know, it's not a, not a situation where you developed from such a young age, you identified when you were nine years old and, you know, you were the next thing, you know, the next big thing, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that you, you went through your process and you identified at the age with, in which our boys are right now. Yeah. So it's, it's a um, development, development soccer, development football is a very interesting and the development path of each child or player is, is also different. You know, it goes in waves. Sometimes it spikes and then it plateaus for a while. Sometimes it regresses a little bit. Um, and where you end up at the end, uh, nobody knows. Um, and any coach who tries to predict that, I think is silly. I, I think it's nearly impossible. I think it's easy to identify which players are further along at the moment in time. That's, you know, it doesn't take a genius or an eagle's eye to, 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 identify, uh, to identify that. But to say where this player is going to end up when he's 19 or 20, I think, I think that's near impossible. So my message to every player out there is, um, if the word I never like to use is talent, because a lot of kids hide behind that word and, and some kind of expect them to progress or to get better because there are talents. I like to identify players as um, players with perspective or players with potential, better said. Um, having potential means I have the ability to become good, but I still have to put in all the effort that is necessary to become good. So I think those are two things that are very, very uh, important to uh, separate, um, just having potential and actually maximizing my potential. Um, you know, from my own personal experience, I remember just like it was yesterday in the under 15s, I was not in the first 11, um, under 15s and under 16s. And I would go to the coach and ask him, hey, what's going on? Why am I not playing? Why am I not first pick? And he explained it to me. Um, and I tried to learn from that and I did get better. And this is one of the things that um, is to me, as a coach in development soccer for a long time, I always focused on players and the ability to learn. Players who are willing to adapt and to learn quickly, those are the ones to look out for. And the ones I particularly like to identify as top perspective, uh, perspective players. It's a very good, very good answer to that. And that actually is a good uh, segue into the next question. Um, were you ever cut from an academy or dropped to a B reserve youth team? And how did you react or handle it? So you. You talked about the national team um, as, a, as a youth player, but maybe you also want to put some put some perspective of when you were a professional, and you know that might have been especially the first few years. Um, you may be thinking that you were you were good enough to be on the first team, but for whatever reasons, you know, i.e., culture, cultural differences, maybe language language barriers, and your maybe your own mental. Uh, pathway like that you, you weren't you were not put on that first team or you weren't put in the starting lineup so because i was never maybe the best um something that i always focused on and and, and always had and, and i still do is a you know is a, is a hardworking mentality um you know i think that's something that can get players and people in general any field of work you are can uh, put you in places you probably um wouldn't expect yourself to be in and uh, and this is something that I adopted because, you know, I wasn't as far as long as other players earlier. As I mentioned, in the, in the under 15s, under 16s, I wasn't, I wasn't really studying very much, wasn't playing very much. And I certainly wasn't happy. So I tried to learn from that and, and to figure out what was going wrong, what did I need to get better on. And one of my, I would say, most important uh, features or capabilities is to learn quickly and to to apply what I've learned into the field of play. So this is something that, you know, when you're going, stepping ahead, if you're, if you're an under 19 player right now and you try to make the jump into the professional league um, or into the second team, that jump is much greater than it is from the 18s to the 19s or the 17s to 19s. We're talking at least five teams. So you're basically, you're going from under 14 to the under 19s. That's that type of, leap there is from the 19s into the finished game and a lot of players and parents and some coaches don't understand that so players who do not adapt quickly or do not have the ability to learn at a high rate 
and to apply what they've learned into the next days of training or the next week's game um, will struggle in their first six to 12 months at a professional league if they do make it that far. I'm on. You keep hearing uh, about that jump, you know, uh, just being so massive from sort of youth ball and, and into, you know, just reserve football or, or, or professional football. And it, it's funny, a lot of the, 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 the intangibles that you mentioned, Steve, you know, almost have nothing to do now with on the field stuff. You know, it's, it's just the ability, you know, to mentally persevere, uh, you know, to, to be able to, you know, handle rejection uh, almost on a weekly basis, daily basis. And, and just to handle scrutiny, you know, it becomes a, your ability to perform with, with literally everybody watching you, judging you. And, you know, it's in youth soccer, you know, you tend to have a good game or a good moment. And uh, for, for years I've been hearing now, you know, look what uh, so-and-so, I remember he did this two years ago. Um, and it was just so brilliant. And we still talk about it to this day. And, you know, and, 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 and once you make that jump to the other side, it's, you know, those minutes last but, but two minutes, you know, it's, it's what can you give me now moving forward? And, you know, it's, it's, it's really a dial for, for most players to, uh, to, to be able to switch on. And, and if you can't, then it, it really, you know, becomes a great water to make that jump overall, right? So that's it's a great point, Steve. I'm, I'm going to leave you with Coach Amrick here, uh, who had some questions as well. Um, one of our main academy coaches here as well who wanted to jump on the call. Please introduce yourself, Coach Amrick. Yeah, hey Stephen, thanks for taking the time out. I know you're you're a few hours ahead of us and getting closer to bedtime for you, but I uh, uh, really appreciate it. And I know you talked about uh, adaptability being a key characteristic. You, you uh, alluded to in a couple of the answers from the previous questions, but uh, I wanted you to kind of expand on that a bit more and kind of give me some of the key qualities you see in uh, or saw in what the most successful players you played with, both on and off the field. Um. I think I think the thirst of knowledge and just in general of of, of, of people of trying to uh, progress their personal situation is extremely important, even in sports. Um, you know, if we're looking at a coach, uh, well, before I get into that, let me just say this: I didn't finish my uh, development as a player um, on and off the field, which is strictly talk about the soccer side of things, not the personal side of things yet. Um, I wasn't finished until I was 31. So my development went way into the end of, almost the end of my career. I ended up, I stopped playing at 35. So at 31, I was pretty much a finished product, if you will, uh, or player, um, where I really felt comfortable physically keeping up with the best of the league. So my physical attributes were still at that level, I could perform at the highest level. And I had learned enough about the game to where I could, I was felt comfortable in any situation at any moment in time in the game I was presented with. I had a solution. So I had both. I had the cognitive side of the game, the learning side of the game. I understood the game as well as the physical attributes um, at the peak level. And that took me until I was 31. Um, and I, I, I will say this, that most players need until at least the end of their 20s. So 27, usually 26, 27, 28 is when players are finished. I need a little longer. So <laughs> Fair, fair. No, no, exactly. And I, uh, as Coach Manny said, I work with the academy, but also a goalkeeper coach. So you hear that a lot. The goalkeepers, they mature and develop their game a lot later, obviously, than players, which they can go on to play almost until their late 30s. Because, again, it's more learning from the game and experiences when you're Correct. younger that you can adapt from. So that was great. I uh, appreciate that. And now uh, I'm going to have you try to pinpoint, in your opinion, what makes a complete player? Well, I think if you look at a player, there are four components um, that you know, I think we're all familiar with. There's the physical side, so you have physicality, you have the technical side, you have the tactical side, and there's the mental side of the game. Um, and I think those four components, depending on the personality of the player, you can split it either way. You know, if, you, if you're a player who is more physical than the next, then I think you need to put more emphasis on that, and that is something um, that is different for everybody. But I think it's the simplest way to, to maybe – describe a player, I would even go as far as, um, you know, that the mental side of the game is something that is becoming more and more important. Um, and I wanted to touch on this point earlier. If you're looking at a coach like uh, Pep Guardiola, if it was up to him, he would have 10 center midfielders on the field at all the time. He wants players to think, to feel, to react, um, 
to understand the game of football. And that is his perfect player, uh, would be a center midfielder. And I really do think we're moving in that direction because the, 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 the game we are moving into is super fast. Players are having to make decisions um, at all times. They're having to gather information, process that information, make a decision, and then um, execute that decision that they've made. You know, obviously at the end of the execution, we know then, is, was it a good or bad decision or was it just a technical failure on the side of the execution? So um, I think players are going to become, of the future, going to be more cerebral and have to process information quicker. And I think those are the players we need to start training and those are the attributes we need to build in our training programs as well. Um, so I think, I think uh, to answer your question, I'm, I'm looking for players – who are thinking the game, who can feel the game, um, and have solutions. And these are the type of players not forgetting the physical side of the game, of course, because it also is getting faster physically. Um, but I'm looking out for these players who can think one step ahead. Aaron, no, no, completely agree. And it's funny you mentioned Pep Guardiola. Uh, again, he's gone through three goalkeepers in two two years to try to develop a goalkeeper that, like you said, thinks like a center midfielder. And you think he finally nailed it with a player that can kind of execute out right out of the far, far back being a goalkeeper. So, yes, I like that whole thinks the game and thinks ahead, lives the game, breathes the game sort of thing, always looking for solutions. So my last one's going to kind of be more geared to, I guess, uh, routines. Players will have rituals, pregame, mental, like, you know, certain music they listen to. So do you feel, uh, I, I guess, uh, for routine based, uh, what do you get yourself, like how do you get yourself in the right mindset before either a training or a game? Is, is there a difference between the two in your eyes and how you kind of got yourself ready for them? Um, of course, I can speak for myself and I will, uh, but I, I will say this, having been in many teams in my, in my career and uh, as a coach, I've, I've uh, been able to, to, to coach um, a lot of teams so far. So everybody's different and we all have different approaches to it. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a people person. I like being around people. Um, I don't do, do, I don't do well with putting some headphones on my head and getting in my own world and getting in the tunnel and listening to music and just focusing on one thing. I need to engage, interact with my teammates, talk to them. Um, it also takes the nerves away a little bit for me personally. So, um, I wasn't one just to sit there in a the corner and do my own thing. I needed to, to talk. I needed to talk things over with the coach, go over set pieces, um, get my brain working before I went out in the field uh, and before I warmed up my body. So really um, for me, it was as a player, it was always a, a mix of thinking and reacting. So kind of how, you know, the more you think out in the field, the less time you actually have to react and to, to, you know, to, to execute any sort of action you're playing out in the field. So I always told myself, Hey, don't overthink things. You also have to react. So it was always kind of going from one road to the next feeling the game and reacting um, and using your physical capabilities, but on the other hand, thinking your way through games as well. Um, not just one works. It's really a mix of both. And I think every player has to kind of first and foremost understand what he is as a, as a person or her. What type of person am I? How, do, how can I focus? Um, what's good for me? And that is the advantage of a player. You can focus on yourself. Um, as a coach, you can't, obviously. We have to focus on the entire group. So players can afford to be a little more egoistic in that sense. They need to figure out what's good for them and how can they put themselves in a situation to help the team. So um, for me personally, it was talking about the game, talking about the opponent, talking to my, my uh, as a right back, my right center back. Hey, what are we going to do today against them? They have three forwards. They have a good winger, um, a pretty strong center forward. It drips out to my side. How are we going to deal with this today? So to me, it was kind of, um, getting a mental plan and picture, painting a picture before the game and, and vocalizing that verbally um, in order to prepare myself. No, that's great. No, pre perfect. I really appreciate those. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Manny now to kind of see what he's got to do yeah, for you. It's, it's great perspective to hear. Just, you know, so much focus uh, from your end on, on you know, at, at, the, at the professional spectrum on the, on the cerebral side of the game. I think, you know, from, from our standpoint in, in our sport and in sports in general, the, the athleticism is just so second nature, um, you know, whether it's basketball, whether it's hockey, whether, you know, it's soccer or football, that, you know, the, the, you know, the ability to, 
to go at 100 miles an hour, you know, it's, it's not just a rarity now in, in, in layers is where you would see, you know, maybe a Gattuso back in the days that would be known for his energy. It just seems to be commonplace. Um, but the ability to quarterback those situations or point guard those situations at 100 miles an hour have, have now become a, a, a premium. So I, I definitely think, you know, the tactical understanding is, uh, of, of the game is, is definitely the future, you know, is recognizing, uh, you know, harnessing players that can recognize, you know, these situations ahead of time, uh, you know, stay versed uh, within those. So it was, it was great to hear that. You know, and we were really excited to have you here with us today as uh, I, I think that you represent a, a wave of players, um, you know, along the lines from, I could talk from a Canadian standpoint, uh, along the lines of a Julian de Guzman or an Atiba Hutchinson or a Dwayne de Rosario, um, which are guys that have, you know, forged their careers in Europe, you know, humbly speaking, not, not to have a, you know, Euro snob mentality or things of that nature, but uh, it, it, is, it, it is a different level and it was definitely a tremendously different level at the time when, when you guys, uh, you know, were, were playing um, and now are, are in positions where, you know, you, you, you're referenced uh, towards the, the game on, on both sides of the pond. So can you tell us, you know, what are some of the similarities, some of the differences that you've seen, you know, both in the game in Germany and, and I'll, I'll say in North America because, you know, now top level youth soccer in, in Canada is so tied in, 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 in top level soccer in the U.S. You know, if you're a top level team, in Canada, you are, you know, playing a, a pretty balanced schedule in the U.S. So what are some of the main similarities and differences that you've seen over your, your last 20 years as a pro? Well, I think um, I will say this. Um, as, a, as a youth coach in the academy at Hanover uh, 96, um, I obviously had the door open all times for players from North America and, and saw a lot of players and was able to evaluate most of the players. And one of the things that, that I did come across, and I still do, is that you know when a when a North American American player comes over, I feel at the let's say at the age of sixteen, I think they are very well schooled um, technically, um, physically, and mentally. I think those three sides of the game, um, a North American player is pretty far along, just as far along as a European one. Um, what happens between the ages of sixteen and eighteen? Um, is the amount of games or high quality games these players are getting at a tactical level um, do, does not exist in North America yet, that they're getting week in and week out like they do have in Europe. For example, in Germany, there's the A and B youth Bundesliga. So you're playing against all of these other major clubs throughout Germany, and the games are really high level, and these players from the ages of 16 and 18 are, are, um, are you know, getting sometimes a little too much tactical coaching at that level because it kind of gets more about the uh, – the score line than it does the development of the player. But I will say this, the games are played at a very high level, speaking in a tactical sense. And that is the gap. That is the difference between a European player when they're 18 and a North American player when they're 18 or 17. So I think this side of the game, um, there is room for improvement in North America. For sure. And with, with that said, you know, there is, uh, you know, a, a young wave of, of players, you know, coming through from 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 the U.S. Especially, you know, there are some sprinklings of, of players coming in from from Canada as well in, in, into the German system, and you know, a lot of these players are, are now starting to make a good impact as well, um, and that's great to see. Um, you know, we have you know players that are walking into you know these German systems, which you know within six months to a year are you know contributors to first teams at still relatively young age. So what are, what are some of the things that you think that maybe some of these North American players are, are bringing that, that, are, that are helping them make the jump or maybe some of the things that lack in Germany that, that, that we may have? So the key, the key factor to me, um, what is really, what a lot of German clubs love about North American players um, is really their mentality. Um, the mentality of working hard, not giving up, um, wanting to succeed and, and willing to put in the effort to succeed. And that is something that um, I think the average German player doesn't necessarily have. Um, there, obviously, there are players who have that, but the average player probably does not have it as much as a North American player would. And I think the reason, the reason for that um, is at a very young age here in Germany, clubs are forced to um, pay the players. Um, you know, in the United States for a long time, and I'm not too familiar with how it is in, in Canada, but 
um, you used to play to you used to pay to play. And um, you know, I, I do know that in some of the MLS academies that's changing now, and which I will which will change the perspective of the player and the families. And families will get used to that, and they'll get used to being wanted by clubs. And clubs are, are going to have to work more to get players, uh, meaning they're going to have to pay. And this is what's happened in Germany that there's a lot of money in youth soccer being paid to the players and the families in order to get the kids there. And 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 the result of that is that the players no longer have are no longer self-driven. They're driven by other means. And, and this, is, this is a problem long-term on the mentality side of the game. This is why I think this is something we need to be careful of in North America and not to lose, because that's a huge advantage for, us, player, for our players as opposed to the German and most of the Europeans. Understood. And, and to touch back uh, uh, and, and round off a little bit on you now here, you know, as, as coming up in, in, in Hanover, you know, I, I think your, your portfolio is, is something that, you know, during the time where, when it was going on, I, I mean, it just, everything went so fast. And, you know, now that we round up to the, your career is over, it's like, wow, this is, this is a really solid portfolio that you put down, you know, three World Cups, you know, captaining Hanover 96. You know, anytime I, I, I heard from Ainsley or from Julian about Hanover, I heard about I heard your name or I heard another name by, by the name of Atlin Lala, which was someone that Julian uh, would speak about, one of the best players he says he's ever played with. So, you know, putting <laughs> a, a, a strong 20-year chapter uh, of your career here, you know, how, how would you describe it? Like a kid going from, from sunny California to Bundesliga captain, you know, uh, what were some of the highlights? What were some of the moments that stood out? Certainly, um, yeah, I mean, the, the year and a half, um, at the University of Portland got me a little used to the weather so that that helped um, and, but it's been it's been it's been quite a ride of course I had no idea I was gonna stay here this long um, but um, the people along the way are the reason why I stayed uh, I've met some wonderful people and um, um, made a conscious decision early on in my career somewhat conscious and the other I'll get to the other point but conscious decision to kind of integrate myself into the culture and the language right away. So I wasted no time and that enabled or opened so many doors. Um, as soon as you integrate yourself into the culture and the language and the city, um, things become much easier. And then you actually start to feel at home at a place you probably could have never seen yourself or foreseen yourself calling home, um, which I do now and I've been here now half my life. So. I would say to answer your question, the people along the way, um, an open mind and, and put in the work to make yourself a part of the community. Um, that has made it such a long career. And, you know, I didn't play well at every single moment in my career. And so I think those, those factors of being a part of community and, and showing them you want to be here and, and uh, showing them you want to be a part of them and you are a part of them um, did get me through some of those tough times. What were some of the highlights that stood out uh, over your time at Hanover? Certainly, anytime um, uh, you know, boys from across the pond came over and played for the club. So obviously, the time with Julian was very special, um, and Ainsley as well. And you know, guy Connor Casey, an American who played over here with me. Uh, I don't think there was a day went by we didn't we didn't cry from laughing. It was it was just hilarious, and it was so much fun. So. Um, those are definitely my personal highlights. Um, you know, Clint Mathis was over here, lived for me a while. I think Aza was here at the same time with Clint. Those are some pretty wild times. Um, I don't know if Clint is listening or will ever hear this, but um, it was it was uh, it was it was quite a ride. I will say that. Um, you know, and then another American from San Diego, Sal Cizzo. So anytime anytime I was able to spend time over here with an American or a Canadian, it was uh, it was pretty special and special in those. Those would probably be my highlights, as opposed to one game or something we achieved on the field. Because um, this is kind of how I view life. It's all about experiences and, and, and making the most of it and learning from people and taking people along with you. So um, those, those are my highlights for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it really puts it into perspective now that we have this, you know, downtime. You know, we, uh, we, we sort of miss, you know, that camaraderie, right? Those little, those little opportunities you have just to giggle, you know, just to get on the field, uh, just, you know, chat about a moment. It's not really, you know, we're remembering all this, this tournament or, you know, this, this, uh, this good accomplishment from the team. Uh, that's, you know, that's really, 
uh, I hear that a lot from players, you know, that they miss sort of that, uh, or, or those things stand out to them that, uh, that, you know, that everyday connection that, that, uh, that you experience as, as, as a player. So my, my last question to you, Stephen, and I pre- really appreciate you taking your, t- your time today. It's been very insightful is, uh, you know, you touched upon earlier about, you know, immersing yourself in, in, in the culture and immersing yourself in, in the systems in, in, in play. Overall, the German system, it, it, it's, it's a well-known system. It's a respected platform, you know, for, for youth players in, in Europe. You know, um, what, can a, what can a youth player from Canada or, or from the U.S. expect you know, in his, in his first six months uh, to a year in, in, in Germany, I, I know that it's, it's definitely would constitute a culture shock, you know, in, in, in many positive ways, uh, as well as, you know, maybe some things that uh, players aren't comfortable with. So what can a, a player, you know, expect coming from North America, you know, uh, going in, in, into Germany? Um. I would say I would say there are some there are some obviously cultural differences. So I think um, you know functionality and and um, following rules and and uh, you know staying staying within the lines is, is extremely important here. Um, um, but also at the same time, um, speaking up for yourself and if and if you feel that things are not going the right way, you really should and are expected upon speaking in your mind. So I think that's something that. If, you know, coming from the United States, everything is great and sort of being superficial. How are you doing today? Oh, it's wonderful. You look amazing, all of this. Um, that doesn't fly here. That's something that, um, um, you know, they more frown upon. They want to hear the truth. And they will tell you the truth. It's how you played, how you trained. Um, but it's a two-way street that needs to go back as well. So, hey, coach, what's going on? Why am I not playing? Tell me specifically what I need to get better at. Help me out. Give me some drills. Do this and that. So I think you really need to be um, um, careful about not being too nice and just trying to fit in, but really getting your elbows out and, and, and finding space for yourself to grow and to force people to make you grow and to allow you grow. Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer. It's, uh, it's almost shocking for us coming from our culture to, to you know, hear people be so direct, uh, you know, about players and once we send them over there and just to say, hey, you know what? He, he didn't look that great or, or, you know, like as we're here, you know, you bring somebody on a trial and, you know, the person has two left feet, but you're, you're sort of, you know, sugarcoating it a little bit, or that's, that's yeah. just a little bit more, you know, into our cultural norms. And, and that's something that, uh, you know, I think it's important for, for our players to understand just the, the directness involved, you know, at, at that level for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to, to sum it up, trying to be everybody's darling will get you nowhere here. Um, yeah. You're going to have to fight your way through and you have to stand up for yourself. And, and if you want to develop, you need to make people help you develop, get developed. And um, um, it's definitely possible for sure. And I think if you have a goal set in your mind and you want to do it and you're willing to sacrifice, um, then you will achieve your goals. It's a wonderful system to get yourself into at a younger age because um, they will develop you. That's for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. From from that standpoint, it's uh, you know it's 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 great. Uh, we do have uh, you know players that are now flipping and coming in across the pond, Steve. And and for for us to get some perspective and some from some insight from from you is 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 fantastic. You know, especially with you know our players now starting to to trickle into the German system and you know players that that we also know that 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 would be you know relevant uh, to to hear this conversation out from such a such a versed athlete um, as yourself. So. Uh, more importantly, I, I wanted to wish you and, and your family to uh, to stay safe and to stay healthy uh, during this time. You know, we we can only follow uh, the news worldwide, and uh, obviously, it's 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 a challenging time for for all of us, not only in in, in, in the soccer family, but also in, in in the global community. And I I wish you and your loved ones to uh, to stay to stay well and to stay safe. And I uh, thank you very much for uh, for taking the time out to, uh, to to have a chat with us today. Uh, it was really really uh, in, insightful and, and and informative. Thank you guys, and obviously the same goes from my end. Uh, stay healthy, Ainsley. Um, Thanks, keep brother. That, keep that beard short. I like it better that way. All right. I'm, trying, I'm trying to catch up to you. I don't think he's going back to the field, Steve. He's just running webinars, moving forward. He's just- like. This is, as long, this is as long as it can get to. I've been trying. Three weeks sounds. 
Yeah. You put some tia, 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 I'm trying, man, but it don't work. Uh, that's me. It's better. Thanks for your time. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Right, guys. Great to see you again, right. man. See you guys later.